Good to go. Um, everybody ready? There we go. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Loop and Learn, the Type 1 Diabetes Speaker Series. Uh, and please notice our new logo. We are, we are launching this week with the new logo, new look. And once again, I know I say this frequently, we have an amazing guest today. Uh, you'll get to listen to Dr. Francine Kaufman, who is the chief medical officer currently for Sensionics, the makers of Eversense, which is the first and only implantable CGM. It is on the market and uh, you'll get to learn an awful lot today. As usual, we'll just go through our normal disclaimer. Uh, the Loop app is a do-it-yourself closed loop algorithm. And while it may seem obvious, please consult with your healthcare professionals regarding your diabetes management. Remember, this is a project that is highly experimental, not FDA approved for therapy. And we are not healthcare professionals. So you must check with your doctors. You take full responsibility for building and running the system and do so at your own risk. And once more, I want to plug the, the new website, the loopandlearn.org website. It has gone through a tremendous revolution um, and it's getting more and more powerful and as well as loop docs being updated. So please check out uh, loop and learn, join the newsletter because you will get weekly updates on uh, tips and things you might want to know, uh, updates on iOS, uh, the speaker series, and anything that else pertains to DIY looping and possibly just living with diabetes. Um, please know that Marion Barker is, is the power behind this website at this point. It's, it's really going through changes. Uh, Carol, Ivana, Barb, Mark, Kenny, Priscilla, Glenn, and many, many more volunteers. A lot of effort going into this and it's been pretty remarkable. So let me tell you a little bit about what you're gonna to hear today. And I'm just really thrilled and honored um, that we are hosting Dr. Francine Kaufman, world-renowned pediatric endocrinologist, industry leader, and philanthropist. And if she gets a chance to ch chat about that, you'll be fascinated. Before joining Medtronic Diabetes in 2009 as CMO, which is Chief Medical Officer and VP of Global Medical Affairs, Dr. Kaufman was already a distinguished leader in the world of diabetes. She is a former president of the American Diabetes Association who was consistently named one of the best doctors in America. She really is, she really, really is. You'll listen, you'll learn. Dr. Kaufman joined Medtronic Diabetes back in 2009. She predicted that by the time she'd retire, there would be an FDA approved closed loop system on the market, and she wasn't wrong. She announced her retirement from Medtronic at the end of 2018 with the introduction of the 670G hybrid closed loop system. Prior to joining industry with Medtronic, she worked for more than 40 years as a pediatric endocrinologist in Los Angeles, California, and also served as director of the Comprehensive Childhood Diabetes Center and head of the Center of Endocrinology, Diabetes and Metabolism at Children's Hospital of Los Angeles. She is known for her leading work as a clinician and researcher for making a global impact on diabetes care in developing worlds. After retiring from Medtronic, she didn't retire. She joined the executive leadership team at Sensionics as chief medical officer, where she is instrumental in helping drive forward their innovation platform ever since, which is the first and only implantable CGM available in the world. Dr. Kaufman is one of the world's leading endocrinologists, this is a quote, and her deep understanding of the global medical research and clinical diabetes community is coupled with her track record of applying novel technologies to advance diabetes care for patients and her extreme passion for her patient care and interaction. That's a quote from Tim Goodow, the president and CEO of Sensionics. Um, that's a whole lot. Um, but it's all true. And we are very, very fortunate to be able to hear everything that Dr. Kaufman has to say. Thank you so much for spending your Sunday um, afternoon with us. Welcome. Well, thank you. I, I feel like I should just leave now because I'm not sure I can live up to what all those words actually imply, but I'm honored to be here. I'm always, um, most energized by talking to people with diabetes or I'm as a pediatric endocrinologist, often parents of children with diabetes. 
to really try to understand, um, you know, what still are the unmet needs? How can we, um, both from academia, and I still see patients, I still have my role at the Academic Medical Center at USC, um, as well as an industry can really meet the future um, and, and make living with this disease uh, more manageable. So um, I'm gonna talk a, a, about ever since, um, that's what Joanne asked me to do. So first I'm gonna try to find um, my slides. Um, and right now I can't seem to, okay, I'm getting there. Here we go. So can everybody see that? Uh, yes. Okay, great. So let me just minimize my own picture. Um, so let me kind of go on and um, I don't think I need to convince any of you that while finger stick glucose measurements are really in, you know, critically important um, and were a huge advance in diabetes management, I started my career before finger sticks were used in clinical care. Um, they do have a tendency to miss all the highs and lows in between those normal values that may be represented by your four to six to eight to 10 finger sticks a day. So there's really a role for CGM. Um, and uh, it is, uh, I think, after finger sticks, after insulin, um, it is really a, a tremendous advantage for people with diabetes. And as a healthcare provider, it offers me the kind of information that is really truly actionable and that I can work with my patients uh, over. So we know there are now four um, available companies that have devices out there. Um, a couple of them have more than one device in the market at the present time. And all the other devices are what we would call transcutaneous. So they go through the skin, they're still connected with something outside the skin, go through the skin and then end up in the interstitial space, the space here to measure uh, the interstitial fluid. Whereas the Eversense CGM system is fully implanted. So this is um, put in by a small incision that's done in the office um, that's closed by steri strips. Uh, the skin heals, uh, the transmitter is placed on top. And um, as a result, it's a closed system. So there's no communication. There's no chance that this can actually get pulled out. Um, this transmitter can fall off. You put it back on again and there's no um, harm done to the sensor. So all the companies are measuring glucose in the same space, this interstitial fluid in the subcutaneous space. Um, there, um, all the other ones are doing it enzymatically. We are doing it with a fluorescent based technology. So a little bit different as to how the glucose value is derived. Um, and um, as a result, the things that interfere with some of the enzymatic uh, sensors do not interfere with Eversense. Um, and uh, it is uh, otherwise pretty much the same. So they're going in and out of the same space. We're staying in that same space for 90 days in the US, 180 days outside the US. And we have applied to the FDA um, with a PMA uh, uh, application that is asking for extension of our 90 day product to 180 day product after a very long and arduous study was done after modifications were made to the sensor itself to enable it to last um, and actually be the next generation after the 180 day product that we have outside the US. So pretty much what I talked about, so this is how the transcutaneous sensors go. So there's something um, communicating with the transmitter. It is attached to the transmitter, goes into the um, sub Q space and ours is implanted there for good. Uh, again, the difference between the enzymatic reaction and the fluorescent measurement. Um, and uh, the difference, really the main difference is in the duration. As a result of it being um, a fluorescent based technology, it can last 90, 180, 365 um, potential days in place, um, which we think is um, a differentiator for us and something that will hopefully um, continue to have people interested in exploring using Eversense itself. So um, what's the system contain? So there's a sensor, it's very small. Um, it measures about three by 18 millimeters. Um, so it's very small, um, fully implanted. And then above it sits a transmitter 
and it needs to be put on with um, an adhesive. It happens to be a silicone based adhesive, which is um, very gentle and mild on the skin. And our skin reaction rate is uh, actually very, very low. And the transmitter actually puts uh, the energy into the sensor through near field energy source and actually powers the sensor. So the transmitter has to be on for the sensor to be active and working. Um, and one of the things the transmitter does, it sends down um, uh, the energy. This actually excites some um, LEDs in the sensor itself. Those LEDs light up the sensing surface, which can pick up the reversible binding of glucose. It does this every five minutes. So the glucose attaches, unattaches, more glucose reattaches, and is able to then measure the interstitial glucose um, concentration. The uh, sensor sends back the raw signal to the transmitter and the transmitter does all the calculations and then sends that to a um, mobile medical application at an app on the smartphone. There's no extra receiver and all the information sent to the smartphone is essentially everything that you're used to with the other um, CGM devices. So uh, actual alerts at a threshold, predictive alerts, rate of change alerts, um, all the other kind of uh, alerts that you need to be uh, aware of, can, particularly um, you know, concerning glucose trends. And on the mobile app, you can see the glu present glucose value, arrows, the overall trend. You can um, you know, press a number of buttons and change the horizon that you're looking at the glucose, get other glucometrics. You can look at you know, the last four hours, the last um, up to three months, what's your time and range, all those kind of things that people are becoming increasingly interested in. And um, I wanna be sure that one of the big differentiators is that this transmitter itself vibrates when one of these alerts is triggered. So the alerts are sent to the phone where you can see them, where you can hear them. And then on the body itself is also um, a vibratory alert. It's the only device that has this and it vibrates um, in different ways, depending whether you're on your way high or low um, or for other issues that you may want to set. So again, um, fully implanted, it's inserted and removed by trained and certified either MDs, DOs, physicians assistants, uh, nurse practitioners. Um, and again, it lasts 90 days in the US, 180 days outside and indicated right now only for 18 years of age and above. And it's a replacement for finger sticks, so it is not um, an adjunctive device, it's a non-adjunctive device. So just kind of going over um, some of, again, some of the differences. Um, and I, you know, as a healthcare provider, what's one of my goals is to help my patients want to uh, adopt using CGM and then also to being able to be incredibly successful with CGM, whether they use it uh, with MDI. I have a number of incredibly successful patients who do not want to wear a pump and use a sensor with MDI. Um, there are some patients who want that pump to be independent of what the sensor information um, is relaying. So um, they may have a pump from a, another sensor and use our sensor. But right now we have not integrated with any pump systems. Um, with this submission that we have in front of the FDA right now, we're going to, once that approval comes through, then we'll reapply, we will then apply for the ICGM category. And then hopefully within the next year or so, I'm not exactly sure about timing, um, we will be able to then hopefully connect in a closed loop system um, and, um, you know, hopefully with the pumps that are open for this interoperability. So um, a lot of people like the fact that the sensor is inserted by a provider. It addresses patient dexterity, um, you know, memory challenges. We do have Medicare approval and um, a fair number of our patients are in the Medicare age range. Um, and this seems to be um, a particularly good device for some of them who are having perhaps memory challenges or can't um, do the complexity of inserting their own sensor themselves or lack dexterity um, from other comorbid uh, conditions. So the transmitter is easy to remove and reapply. Um, it 
you know, we think at least our data looks like it uh, improves some of the adherence measures to CGM in our clinical trials. Obviously, the adherence rates are um, way above the 90 uh, percentile, uh, 90 percent of the time. Um, and in the real world, it's about 84 percent of the time that the patients leave the transmitter on, um, which means they're getting the information from the sensor. The sensor is always there but the transmitter must be on the skin for the sensor to be powered and to get the information. Um, however, some people want to take a break here and there and um, leave the transmitter off on purpose. Um, there are some patients who we know don't care about wearing a CGM during the daytime. They feel that they're able to manage their diabetes. Um, you know, some of these are type two patients who are using insulin and um, only apply the transmitter for nighttime protection. So it does offer a fair amount of flexibility depending on how people um, want to use CGM. Again, it's a mild silicone-based adhesive that reduces skin issues. Um, the sensor, since it's implanted, can't get dislodged. I talked about this on-body vibration that a lot of people really like. Um, you know, Particularly, it means if I run downstairs and I don't have my um, uh, receiver or my phone with me, I'll still get a, an alert if there's an issue going on with my uh, glucose management. Um, the procedures are another time to see your MD, I'm not sure, um, or your healthcare provider, I'm not sure that's a, um, a, a real plus or not, um, particularly in the time of COVID. Um, but it is, uh, you know, every time you have it inserted, uh, you need to be in front of your healthcare provider and then it's removed. Um, uh, 90 days later, another sensor is uh, re uh, reinserted. You come back another 90 days, and this removal and insertion procedure uh, continues on. We have the same share capability, up to five share partners. There's a data management system, very similar to all the other data management systems. It's automatically uploaded into the cloud, so you don't have to do a separate upload like you still have to do with some of the systems. It has um, great high accuracy in the low end of the glucose range, and um, the sensor can remain in place during an MRI procedure. The transmitter needs to be taken off, however. Um, so, uh, you know, just to kind of uh, show, we end up with the same kind of data, um, the same graphs, the same AGP report, um, this uh, ambulatory glucose profile that's been promulgated as at least a similar way to look at all the CGM uh, data management retrospectively so that it's not so hard for the patient who may want to switch from um, one system to another, and particularly not so hard for the healthcare professional who wades through different reports, isn't exactly sure what they're looking at. At least now there's this common report called the AGP and as a result, we're talking more and more about glucometrics and looking at those 288 glucose values a day and kind of racking and stacking them so that um, I'm not just looking at what's my glucose value right now, what's my arrow so I can anticipate where I might be, looking a little retrospectively, where was I before, um, but really looking at maybe every week or every two weeks um, maybe it's every month or every three months, looking at the overall data and looking at this glucometric set of data so I can see my time in range, my time above range, and my time below range. Um, and this has been particularly valuable during the time of COVID when it was very difficult to get an A1C measurement. Why? Because people didn't want to go to a laboratory, they certainly didn't want to come into a place like Children's Hospital Los Angeles. Um, so I could look at their CGM uploads and get these glucometrics and be able to determine whether my patient was achieving the targets that we had set together. These are the overall targets that the medical community has set for people, but those need to then be individualized for each patient at you know where they are at the time with their diabetes management in their life, and um, you know sometimes it's actually better than these. Sometimes it's a little bit um, more forgiving than these, just depending on what's happening. And I think we're going to be seeing this more and more as telemedicine uh, may be 
waning a little bit as in face patient visits uh, with uh, their healthcare providers are starting to occur again, but I don't think they're ever going to go away. And, you know, kind of the concept that maybe I see my patients rather than four times a year, maybe in person two times a year. And the other two times we do a telehealth visit. So it's more convenient for them. Um, and yet with the CGM, I can get the important information and they don't even have to go to a laboratory. So I, I don't know if all of you know um, these different uh, target ranges for uh, the glucometrics, but this is for the uh, overall patient with type 1 and type 2 on intensive regimens where we're hoping 70% of the time um, the patient has in the target range of 70 to 180, um, obviously then 25% of the time above and 4% of the time below. Older adults, um, you know, this is straight out of the ADA standards of care um, and uh, it, not sure I, I agree with it. They actually um, suggest perhaps the same thing for children, and I don't agree with that at all. That 50% time and range is okay. Obviously, pregnancy, we change what the time and range is, and now it's 63 to 140, and we need the 70% there. And if it's gestational diabetes, even more of the time in range. So, um, CGM, all of them provide this kind of information that I think is the new standard, the new way to look at. How am I doing against my own uh, targets that hopefully each one of you set with your healthcare provider? And then you can always look back and say, uh, and then compare to what the community said should be the overall average kind of uh, glucometrics for somebody with intensively managed diabetes. So now let me talk a little bit more about ever since. Um, so we did three pivotal trials. Um, the first one was actually with 180 day device and it was a number of years ago, but it did allow us to get approval in Europe at the time. Um, and then we did two more to actually hone in on the first device we wanted to have in the US, which is the 90 day device so that we could have improved accuracy. And the mark for that device is 8.5. Um, you know, the other devices are mainly in the nine range. So we do have excellent accuracy during these studies, obviously tremendous adherence to using the device um, more than 23 hours a day. Um, I hope you're aware that there's lots of ways to look at accuracy measures for CGM. One of them is the SMARD mean absolute relative difference between the CGM reading at the time and a, um, a venous sampling through a Yellow Springs instrument or YSI machine at the time. And that, that is done over the lifetime of the sensor. Multiple, multiple times patients come in and during that they have uh, challenges to result in hyperglycemia and hypoglycemia so that we can see the accuracy and the performance of these devices over the lifespan of the sensor itself as well as over the range of the glucose that it's reporting, which for all of them is 40 to 400. So um, these studies involve lots and lots of data, lots of pair points, lots of sensor readings um, to get to these kind of accurate and ultimately being able to uh, predict and detect hypoglycemia 95% of the time. So um, what, you know, all the, um, Studies done, these pivotal trials are wonderful, absolutely required by the FDA, um, take a lot of time, energy, and money to perform. So uh, some of them involve hundreds of patients to really look at the performance across the different ages, across the different A1C ranges, across both type 1 and type 2 diabetes. And they're very important, um, particularly for the FDA to approve a device. But what really matters is then how, what happens with the device when it's used in the real world? What kind of data is then um, being appreciated and reported? So this is um, a paper we wrote as soon as we, we wanted over 200, we got to 205 patients. Once the device was approved by the FDA, in 2018, we ramped up. It was really, um, you know, um, effectively being sold in 2019 and, 2000, and, and 20, um, 2020. And um, so here's the, the first once it was released in the US. Um, 
A third of the patients were, na were naive to CGM, two thirds were coming from other uh, CGM types. 63% had type one diabetes. And these are the kind of uh, glucometrics that we got in these patients. So their time spent in that target range was 62% of the time. Many of these patients were on MDI. Many of the patients were on pumps. Again, none were on closed loop because we don't have a closed loop connection at this point. And this is considered actually to be excellent for that. And some of the other CGM devices are reporting in the very high 50 range to you know, just approaching 60 or 61% of the time. 4.1% um, of the time below seven, uh, uh, below 70. Um, the goal is to have it less than 4% uh, of the time. Um, and the overall GMI that we could calculate was 7.18. Um, so these are actually really, really good glucometrics showing in the real world that the patients could use the device and um, you know, really avail themselves of the advantages um, of our CGM, but also the advantages of CGM itself. I wanna kind of get back to why is the MARD now 11? Um, this is compared to finger sticks. Um, and we didn't, obviously we don't control what meter people use. We don't um, you know, really actually look at whether it's done with the uh, you know, clean fingers or whatever. But in all the real world um, kind of uh, estimates, it's usually three or 4% higher than what the MARD is in the controlled studies against OYSI. So this is actually quite an excellent MARD um, for the patients in the real world. And then um, many of the patients obviously continue, um, not everybody, um, but we think this is a pretty good continuation rate. And once they get to the second sensor, the continuation rate turns into the mid 80%. Uh, by the time they're at the fourth sensor, they're even higher because um, they're coming back and back and back again because they really like uh, to have an implanted device and they like the long duration. Here's a safety profile. So uh, very little skin irritation as a result of the adhesives. Um, a few mild infections at the insertion site. Um, you know, nobody requiring IV antibiotics or anything like that. And of course, there are uh, still infections from both the insertion for the pump as well as the transcutaneous sensors. Um, can doctors really learn how to do this and then remove the sensor? So a very, very low rate of failure to remove the sensor. And we see that as doctors get more experience, um, they actually, this rate uh, has a tendency to drop. So um, again, pretty, pretty great safety profile and sustained accuracy in the real world data. And then last year at the ADA, since that was only the first 205 patients, we reported um, 1,600 patients and essentially the same kind of uh, overall that we saw with the first 205 patients. So it wasn't a bias of early adopters. It was really something um, showing that even those who are late to adopt to this continue to do very well. And I just wanna point out this Medicare age range, um, they achieve almost the 70% time in the target range and with no increase, um, very low rates of hypoglycemia throw total below 70 of 3.4%. And then obviously the older you are, the more adherent. You know, this, this is an age range that I deal with in my own practice, the adolescent to young adult. And um, I don't know if you're aware, the type one exchange, their average A1C in that age range is over 9%. And now we have this GMI for this group of individuals who don't do as well, don't wear CGM as often, or the transmitter, um, you know, don't wear transcutaneous CGM as often either, um, that their GMI or estimated A1C is actually 7.53%. And that this time and range is actually better than they do, um, obviously um, without a sensor and just relying on some finger ticks or or blinded studies with blinded CGM in that age range. So um, kind of going on, just to look now at some more safety data, and this is safety data that we've derived from our studies in Europe. I'm um, looking at over 3,000 patients, 5,400 sensors, 
um, and actually uh, spanning um, quite a number of different sites in Europe, 15 countries. Um, I think the number of clinics was like 500 different clinics that were used. And if we look at the overall no serious adverse events related to the device or the procedure, less than 1% with um, uh, issues about removing or site infections. And then a subset of almost a thousand of them looking at cycle one, first sensor, second sensor, third sensor, fourth sensor, that there's no um, you know, overall change in sensor performance as the sensor is used over and over again. And many of these sensors are the 180 day sensors. A couple of them were at the very beginning were 90 day, but the vast majority are 180 day, that they can stay in place that they function, that they don't hurt the subcutaneous space, that they don't have something that causes, because it's an implant, um, a decrement of uh, a performance over time. And if you really kind of you know step back and say, well, I do one procedure either every 90 days or ever every 180 days with the Eversense, close the skin, it all heals, everything's fine. Versus, you know, every week, every 10 days or every 14 days, I'm actually going into the same place in the same space. And I'm actually causing maybe even more trauma to the tissue by putting the uh, sensor in, taking it out, putting another one in, taking it out, even with rotation, um, that that is not without any trauma to the same tissue area. Um, and in fact, you know, we are at least able to show that the way this sensor is placed and how it works, there's no evidence that by doing a small in-office procedure that there's any harm done to the tissue so that it can continue to give good information over time. So um, then a great study that came out of Italy um, done by um, uh, one of the big investigators in Italy across multiple sites with her uh, research uh, consortium. 100 patients um, looking at the A1C at baseline was 7.4, went to 6.9, uh, time and range from 63 to 69. And, um, you know, really, really good performance, good adherence, excellent adherence, um, keeping the transmitter on more than 85% of the time. And I do wanna say that um, they subdivided this study up, looking at those who were totally naive to CGM and those who were coming from other CGMs. And it was about 60% uh, were naive and 40% were coming from other CGMs. And those coming from other CGMs, mainly um, you know, the two other available, most commonly used CGMs, that they actually, had even a further improvement in their A1C from 7.0 to 6.8 in those patients, whether they were on MDI or on pumps. Um, and what does this really say? It says that, you know, kind of the new kid on the block, still the different kid on the block um, with all these differentiators, which we think are an advantage for us over time, um, that there is no evidence that coming from a different CGM that you end up with any decrement in the overall management of your diabetes. And if anything, maybe a continued still slight improvement. So um, that was kind of a great study for us. So if we look at all these different things, um, you know, kind of going down this list, uh, CGM certainly, and I don't have to convince any of you, is standard of care. Um, it's needed for diabetes management. Um, it is impossible to imagine now a world without it. We talk more and more about time and range as the new metric to really strive for. Again, I think the beauty of time and range is that I can even better individualize this for my patients. So I have a patient now, been very, very traumatic for her to be in lockdown. Um, she was supposed to, this is her first year in college. She's doing it all remote really gave up on her diabetes. So I'm not gonna try and say, you know, I need you to get 70% of the time in range. I'd be happy right now if she got 50% of the time in range. So I need to really work with my patients where they are, what's important to them, helping them through, um, you know, obviously a very, very difficult year for us all. 
And um, time in range, time below range, time above range is really a great way for me to uh, individualize. And I can only really get that from a CGM. And then obviously the overall, what does it do to the system? is that the money we spend today for CGM reduces the cost of diabetes care and its complications in the future. And you know we need to keep this in mind in front of all those big payers so that, um, and the ADA standards of care for 2021 clearly state that um, the payers should and must in fact, um, allow their, you know, their um, members to have access to CGM. So Eversense is novel and differentiated from the transcutaneous CGMs. Here's our accuracy measurements. They're really, really quite excellent. Um, this Canadian study was done with a 180-day device, which is a little bit higher. But um, you know, now we're talking about lasting 180 days. And this MART actually is pretty equivalent to the MARDs that are available for 10-day um, and better than some of the MARDs available for some of the other ones. Real world data time and range is really excellent. Um, the post-market uh, safety data showing very mild AEs, adverse events, zero serious adverse events related to the device or the procedures. Um, these repeated sensor cycles showing that there's nothing to suggest that somehow we're damaging the subcutaneous space. Um, and that um, as a result, it's gonna be hard to actually um, continue to use it. It's in fact, the exact opposite. As time goes on, the data you get is exactly the same. So there's no decrement occurring um, as a result of the implantation. The Italian study showing this um, remarkable drop in A1C, increase in time and range in including in patients who are coming from other CGM devices, I do want to tell you there's been a study done um, by the Mass General Group, Steve Russell, um, in the same patient using their beta bionic system, wearing a G5, a Libre, and an Eversense, and the Eversense had the best accuracy measurements. And then um, some studies we've done just with patient reported outcomes, um, showing high agreement that this helps decrease the burden of diabetes, increase confidence in diabetes management, whether CGM naive or coming from another CGM source. So um, now I just wanna tell you, that's kind of where we are, but where are we going? So this is our, you know, really gen one. There's been some improvements obviously in the transmitter firmware, um, in the data management system, but essentially the sensor itself has not changed from the first sensors we put in to the sensors we have now. Um, so we are on the verge of a new sensor with enhanced chemistry and some other modifications. We just finished something called the PROMISE study. Um, it involved 181 subjects for 180 days at eight sites in the US. We applied to the FDA for a PMA supplementation um, at the and, and we are hoping um, we applied in the you know in the first half of 2021 and we are hoping that we will hear back from them. Uh, well, actually, we were hoping originally we'd hear from them the first half of 2021. We might hear right, right, right at the very end of uh, 2021, if not the be the uh, beginning of the second half of 2021, because of the um, issues that they've had to face with pulling so many people off of uh, regular work to do these uh, exemptions for things around COVID. Um, but right now we think we're back on track to likely here um, by August and um, then be able to commercialize hopefully around September, October, um, a new product, an enhanced product, enhanced chemistry that in the US will last 180 days and um, will require one calibration a day. I know that sounds maybe like it's you know not um, where you wanna be. The device now actually requires two calibrations a day. The new device will require one. And what happens is you need to charge the transmitter so you hopefully get into a routine. Most people wake up in the morning, 
put the transmitter on the charger for 10 minutes, take their shower, nothing on their skin at that point in time, come back, put the transmitter back on, do a finger stick, and then you're done for the day. So um, that's uh, you know where we will be at. And that is to be able to last 180 days, we do need that one calibration a day. Um, the accuracy and safety are gonna be equivalent to the device we have essentially now. Um, and um, you know, just really, really pretty excited about twice the duration um, with one calibration a day and um, you know, all the other remarkable features again of the on body vibrations, um, the uh, overall uh, issues that people really like where I can remove the transmitter, leave it off for a bit of time if I need to do so. So hopefully we're gonna hear soon. Um, and I do wanna tell you that at the same time, we're asking, we asked the FDA to let us keep in 30 of the patients from the PROMA study, the sensor in for 365 days. So we are going to, once we get that data and those patients are being explanted now, um, we are looking at uh, further enhancements um, for the center to be able to last 365 days. We have um, an IDE that we'll be asking for from the FDA um, around the, you know, the um, late Q3, early Q4, with the goal of starting a study for the 365-day center that will have a calibration once a week. Um, and that we would start that study at the beginning of 2022, and that hopefully um, we would have approval by the end of 2023. Um, and the other um, issue with that as we go on is once we get the 365 day sensor out with one calibration a week, we're going to be looking at actually a way in that sensor that if you have the transmitter off, you would be able to flash it with your phone. So if you wanna have the transmitter off for a period of time, um, you would be able to get a flash glucose from your phone, put the transmitter back on and you have all the real time CGM readings. Um, and then the next step is we would add a battery, um, a very, very small battery. I mean, these batteries are like a joke. They, you can barely see them onto the tip of the sensor and then um, you know, really be able to keep it off and it would store information for um, you know, up to a year. So um, lots, what we feel is exciting. Um, some of it might play very well in the type two arena in addition to the type one, obviously also getting ICGM integrating with pumps and closed loop systems. And now I just wanna show you, you know, kind of what, um, one of our typical patients looks like. Um, they're uh, across all ages from 18 and above. Um, but here's um, one of our retirees who just had trouble with other CGMs, just couldn't use them, couldn't hear the alarms, couldn't remember to keep her phone with her or didn't want to, and chose ever since because of the on-body vibration. So you can look up here, here's her AGP report um, from uh, the ever since DMS system. Here's her overall glucose uh, values. Here's when she's first starting the first sensor. And now here she is at her fourth sensor with almost all of her time and range with her A1C going from 7.3 to 6.3. So, um, you know, in conclusion, you know, it's a disruptive technology. It's not what everybody else is doing. Um, and if one is to say, what is one of my goals as a healthcare provider in the diabetes space is to get as many people as possible on CGM, then one of the things I think we need to do is offer people um, alternatives to the, what now people call the standard CGM, the standard transcutaneous CGM. Um, are we a niche product? I don't think so. I think we're a product that serves the needs of many, many people, athletes, older people, um, the young adults who don't want to pay attention to their diabetes. Um, the other person, you know, people absolutely committed to everything they can do 
to manage their diabetes as effectively as possible. Um, so, uh, you know, we are committed to extending the life span of the center, to reducing the calibrations of the center, to continuing to have our accuracy measurements of the center, um, and to, you know, really enabling people to use this part of standard of care um, so that they can continue to be successful with their diabetes management. So I will stop here and I will stop sharing. And I don't know if anybody has any questions or not. You know, what I love about all this virtual stuff is I could have been just talking to myself. Oh, no, you were absolutely not talking to yourself. Uh, the, comments have been, the comments are flying on YouTube, on uh, Messenger, and in chat. So um, first of all, thank you. Uh, you know this product. It's it, it, it was such a complete presentation. And as we were asking questions among ourselves, they go, oh, she just answered it. Oh, she just got it. So um, I'm just going to take these as they came okay. in and you can deal with them as they come. Um, does Sensionics plan to offer an implantable sensor for type ones without an on-body transmitter? And you had mentioned that as a flash. Is there? Yeah. So, well, but so, so once we get the battery in, um, then you don't need that for the battery source. The big question is how do you transmit out from inside the body? Um, so there is an antenna. It's a very small antenna that goes straight to something, you know, overlaying it. Um, could it be something that's not on your skin, but close enough by to pick up the signal? Now, you know, there's, there's a lot of physics involved here. I don't wanna talk about how, um, you know, the decay by distance is, you know, threefold. So but it, it, it is something we are working on. Um, and, um, you know, there may be antenna. We all talk about Bluetooth, Bluetooth, Bluetooth. Well, Bluetooth antenna are big. That's one of the issues. So, um, you know, we, we have to, as we're going forward, we're making decisions about, you know, how much more can we give on the size um, versus, you know, how, how much can we press it that you might need like a dongle nearby. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then you can definitely flash it without it as well. It would be interesting to have something that just wraps onto your uh, Apple Watch mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. something. So it's there with you, um, particularly the people. That well, are... then, then, you know, we have the, the other issue is, you know, this is a very small implant. Um, you know, we chose to go in the upper arm first. We could go on the wrist and you just wear your watch over it. Oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah. Somehow people don't mind wearing their watch all the time, right? <laughs> but, no, isn't that but, interesting? Yeah. yeah, but the transmitter for any of them or the infusion set seems to be, you know, maybe it's because it's so much more medicalized. Um, right. Yeah, it's, um, well, that is interesting. Um, and now that they're doing apps that track your sleep, you have to wear it pretty much all the time. So um, that makes sense. Um, could you talk for a moment about skin irritation? Um, I had watched some of the early reports. I think it was Amy Tendrick from Diabetes Mind um, mm -hmm. writing quite a bit. Um, and so the question was irritation from being, my question was irritation from being covered all the time um, mm -hmm. in the same space, as opposed to like Omnipod where you move that, uh -huh. that footprint around. So, you know, the silicon-based um, patch is, um, is, is very porous. So there's a lot of breathing through it. Mm -hmm. um, and it is, it, it's not trying to hold something in place. You know, w one of the issues with the transcutaneous sensors is if they move a lot, you're, you're in trouble as well. Mm -hmm. so, so that adhesive has is, is got to be pretty significant to keep the whole thing together and, um, and not moving. Ours is, is so much more giving. And then you definitely take it off every day. You clean the skin, you, you know, it, it really gives you the opportunity. I, you know, many people have called it a naked shower. Um, you know, I, I, I wouldn't want to walk in on somebody who just has their transmitter on and not think they're naked. But um, so we, we have not seen the kind of, you know, year, but, nine months and many people go the same spot, even though the label is you, you need to alternate and we've not you know, really seen skin issues. And we really believe it's got to do with the mild adhesive. Okay, a uh, question about compression lows. 
uh, a lot of people have issues with compression loads with with a Dexcom. Um, yeah. Do you, have you seen any of that? So we did a study. We um, it was part of our precision um, study, and there was not an effect of compression. Okay, so that did not come up. It comes up a lot, I think, mm -hmm. with kids, from what I hear. Um, does the sensor have to be retrieved at the end of life? Well, oh my goodness, um, I have to say yes to that. Although um, the you know one of the issues, obviously, that we faced very early on with the FDA is loss to follow up. Um, and somebody, so, so all the materials are biocompatible and the FDA has, you know, implied that it could, you know, it, it functions like a um, long-term implant. Um, we would like it out. Um, you know, we don't have data that goes out 10 years, although there's nothing to imagine you know, really, it's it. They're all biocompatible. I mean, essentially, the sensor is made out of. Um, it's pretty much like a contact lens material. Okay, so so if it has to stay, I, I've heard early on there were some issues of retrieval. Um, but yeah, it, so we're working on some new in, insertion devices that the retrieval is very dependent on the insertion. Um, and, and so, uh, and then also, um, you know, you can find the sensor with ultrasound, you can find it with a vein finder. So there are ways there, you know, it's like everything. There's a few cowboys out there who, um, just want to go and even if you can't feel it, try to find it. If you can't feel it, we need to know where it is and you need to do something before going to, but you should, I mean, if the, if the insertion is correct, you should be able to feel it. Okay. So, so. Does it feel like a lump? Are you able to pass? No, it, it feels like, um, I mean, exa essentially exactly what it is. You just feel a little, you know, like it's your pencil. This is a, a little bit, okay. Yeah, so if this was under my skin, it's it's softer than this, but it, you, you can mm. kind of feel it. Okay. Um, and it's, I, I wore one, of course, in a study. Um, and um, I like being able to feel it because then I know exactly where to put my transmitter. <laughs> I guess that makes a lot of sense. Well, uh, but there's also there's also an app on the phone that tells you as you're putting it on that you you've got the right spot. Got it. And and do you build up scar tissue if you keep putting it in the same area on the same arm? So, no. I mean, again, um, you know, this is a pretty forgiving space. What is the subcutaneous space? It's mainly gush. Um, you know, in it, it, its true medical term. So it's mainly liquid, some fat cells, little blood vessels coursing through it. Um, you can get some fibroblasts, but you can, you get those when you put an infusion set in. You get those when you put a transcutaneous sensor in. And this is, um, you know, essentially you've gone in, um, well, we've got many patients now who had 10 sensors. Um, and I, you know, uh, at least five of them in, in the same spot. And there's, you know, they're still functioning fine. So, wow. And can you swim with the transmitter on? You can. Very cool. Um, now we're going to get to the questions that a lot of the loopers are asking. Um, mm -hmm. Does the do the readings go to Apple Health? The readings go to um, the Apple Watch. Okay, and that, but that's through an app. That yeah, the, the, okay, yeah. So it's not read into the um, health app. Right, at Is this there, point not. Uh, what would it take for us to encourage you to do that? Um, let me find out. I, I think there would be a lot of questions about that um, because then we access a lot of data through through Apple Health. Um, and and granted, if you wanna jump in on that one, you're, you're welcome. Well, you know what? I, I, I honestly um, may not be the best person to answer any any of those questions. Okay, we'll just keep yeah. throwing at you. Okay. Um, if you don't want to use your arm, what are your other options? So, um, as a chief medical officer, um, I can tell you the label is your arm um, under your you know your deltoid, um, and there are uh, patients who choose with their healthcare providers to put it other places. So it's going into the subcutaneous space. Your subcutaneous space is pretty much everywhere. Um, probably, you know, what we have had reported to us is the, you know, kind of the upper back, right around, um, 
you know, either below the belt line or right above the belt line. Yeah, I, I can see. We this. did do a study um, in Scandinavia with the abdomen and um, people at the end of the study, the, the data was, was fine and good. Um, at the end of the study actually went it back in their arm for the most part. Okay. I, I can see um, maybe this is sexist, but for women, if they're wearing sleeveless, they may not want the transmitter showing if they want to wear it under clothes. Um, so the, it would be nice to have that choice, but that's a half a year choice. Um, and yeah, then maybe you just adapt to it. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, the beauty is, you know, so um, I was talking to one of my patients, you know, who got married, who barely, I mean, when I looked at her wedding dress, it was like, really, you're going to get married covering up so little part of your body? Um, you know, when I got married, I had, a, my neck was up to here, all my sleeves were all the way out. And I had some lace and my mother thought it was not modest enough. So, um, but it's a little different now. So, you know, the deal is just take your transmitter off for, for that time period. And, and then you can go back in and just stick it on and we can get your reading. So. Got it. Um, what happens on your, right now on your daily calibration, if it doesn't come close to matching your device value? So it's got a lot of intelligence. Um, and if it doesn't come close and it meets, you know, certain parameters, it will ask for another calibration. If it doesn't come close and the device meets the parameters, I mean, you know, it may be in the midst of a lag and, and you're going to use that to actually improve the, the sensor value. You know, I, I think the biggest or hardest part about all the CGM is just, it's not, the value is not the same as your blood. Um, you know, there are different compartments of your body. The amount of glucose in my brain is not the same as in my blood and in my eyeballs is not the same as in my blood. So when there's some discrepancy now, of course, the algorithm is trying to turn those calibrations in or, or actually the algorithm, let me put it the other way, algorithm is trying to make the interstitial fluid more like the blood through some of the really advanced mathematics inside these algorithms. So, um, but, you know, if you have a rapid swing up, your interstitial fluid doesn't rapidly change just because you drank eight ounces of juice. So, you know, if, if you, and, and there's ways there's, you know, some of the intelligence in the system might see a rapid change and say, you know, I, I can't make a decision or I can make a decision on whether, you know, we can use that as a calibration point or not. Um, what I see very often in, in Dexcom when it is behaving badly is wait three hours for a reading. Mm. Do you see that happen at all or frequently with Eversense? So not, not too frequently. It, and it, it will redo it in an hour. Uh, it, it might, you know, if it doesn't like it, it will, um, if it really doesn't like it, uh, it will, you know, it will tell you you have to do it in an hour and, and it may blind you for an hour, depending if it, you know, it really feels the, the data is, uh, is questionable. Okay. And I, I know you're waiting for this question. Um, what happens um, or what's the issue with sunny days? And uh, yeah, so that's going to be fixed in, in, in this next system we have. It, it's just looking, it's, you know, it's seeing light. So um this fluorescence is, is um, you know, part of the issue. So all you have to do is just cover it, um, get out of the sun, cover it with something, um, a sleeve, a, you know, a, a band or whatever, and, and get it out of, of the, amb it's called ambient light alert. It will tell you when it's got too much light, um, but the next generation that will be a much less significant problem. So it's light, it's not heat. It's light. Okay, got it. Um, the, the, the group you're talking to um, are early adopters and they are very proactive. So the question is, is there any point in advocating for a smaller or tighter range of time and range with the ADA? Um, and how do we go about doing that? Um, the comment is we'd like to demand more from our device companies. We want better. Well, I mean, this is where um, you know, we could argue forever and ever. I mean, we're, all that is about population health, right? 
So um, it's very different than individual health. I, I don't, I mean, I, what you guys don't see is what, what we do see. I mean, there's people, you know, with A1Cs walking around for years that are 11 and time and range of 20%. Um, you know, how, how do we help those? Now, if somebody has an A1C of 6.5 and not a significant amount of hypoglycemia, nobody I, nobody I know as a healthcare provider is going to try to say, oh, you know, you're 85% time and range. Why don't you go just to 70%? I mean, if you can do it, it's, it's all the better. And it's, you know, it's an average goal. It's not um, an individual goal. I, I don't think there's anything to be gleaned by trying to change it at this point. Um, but, you know, maybe to get a more, um, another category, intensive diabetes outcome or something like that and say, you know, we want 85% time and range should, should be the goal. You, you know, I don't know any really good healthcare provider who's going to stop somebody from doing better than what the population health targets are. Right. We've been asking, as we talk to some of the newer closed loop systems, um, uh, can we have a, a, a two tier system so that if we want to be, uh, more under control or tighter control or different settings and we write off that we accept the responsibility, would we be allowed to have some more input into settings? So, the, Well, I think Medtronic is trying to do that with 770. I mean, you've got a target now to 100. Heard about that. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to shift off this because you pretty much have answered everything that we were throwing into the question. Um, in terms of integration with closed loops, where is the future with ever since? Well, um, we're, that is our future. <laughs> I mean, there's, there's no doubt that um, that's something, you know, we want to do and achieve. So this was a very tough year for us um, when COVID started, or I guess last year was a really tough year for us, 2020. Um, you, you, one of, um, you know, this is public knowledge, we ended up with, you know, a real, real push from a financial standpoint um, and had to reduce our sell, our overall employee uh, base significantly. So some of the things, nothing got taken off the table, things just got shifted. And now we're in really good shape. We've got a partnership with Essencia. Um, you know, we had been partnering on the sales and marketing side in Europe with Roche um, prior. It was um, it, it was a relationship that has now been terminated. Um, and so far, the relationship with Essencia, who was on their way to building their own CGM, mm -hmm. realizing that a BGM company and you know not not them alone, but I think all the BGM companies are starting to realize, you know, what's the future with perhaps the future is with CGM. So we were looking for a partner. They were looking for a partner. Um, you know, we, we uh, met up on a dating app and, uh, you know, here, here we are now living together. So um, it, that's great. We've had a series of uh, funding rounds that have put a uh, you know, a really secure amount of money in the bank for us. So we would have thought we would have the 180 approved by now, this X2 next generation. But, you know, COVID delayed that and delayed everybody getting their, their things approved. So we need that. We need the, you know, revenue source so that we can go forward with not only the ICGM, but all the other things down our pipeline. Because, you know, just imagine if in two and a half years, we could have a sensor that lasts a year with a once a week calibration that you can swipe. And that hopefully will have ICGM. Um, you know, we think that's a really highly attractive product. So, it, it, and one, you know, that could meet the type two needs as well as a really intensive type one needs. That would be, Absolutely fantastic. Would that be the X3 or is that? Oh, well, who knows? Well, yeah. yeah whatever the question is to what yeah. we call anything. Yeah. Yeah. Don't, don't call it Horizon. I guess that name goes away. Um, yeah, yeah. 
Okay, An interesting question uh, from a viewer in Japan. Uh, we have hot springs and it's common for Libre and Dexcom numbers to go nuts uh, due to the heat from the hot spring. Am I correct in understanding ever since wouldn't have the same problem? Oh, uh, yeah. So, so you mean it's like a hot, you're in the hot springs with your sensor on? Mm -hmm. so yeah. A, yeah, so there's a temperature recorder in the center and, and it tries to, you know, equilibrate for temperature. Um, there are some things that it can't equilibrate for. Maybe that might be, you know, I don't know what the temperature is or for how long. Um, it's possible it would be okay. It's possible it might not be okay. I don't know. In a regular jacuzzi or people. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, that's not usually an issue. Okay. Um, question about how do people get involved in future studies or trials? So it's, it's like, um, for our studies so far, they've been mainly the pivotal trials. And you can imagine, so for our, our PROMISE study, it was 181 patients coming in 10 times, 10 hours each visit to be driven high and low and to have um, an IV line in that was drawing every five to 15 minutes. Um, not, not easy studies. So we have to go to the best places to be able to do those kind of studies. So one of them would be, look where those places are. And if you're anywhere near them, um, a lot of them recruit. So there's a site in Seattle, um, Northern California, um, Texas, you know, you, you, for, for those kind of studies, you just need to be near enough. Um, and then, um, uh, you know, be ready to do all that. I mean, you do get compensated for your time um, but, you know, it, th these are lots of things they're asking people to do. And a lot of these patients actually do studies repeatedly. Oh, and one right after the other for one company, then the next company, then the next company. Because um, we're all going, you know, we're all going to the Barbara Davis Center. We're all going, you know, pretty much to the same places. Um, some of the other studies we do, um, and we're hoping to be able to do more studies, um, you know, I'm hoping we could have some kind of study where we would be able to recruit from you, um, recruit from Kelly Close or, you know, some of these, and, and that most of it could be done virtually other than getting, obviously, the sensor implanted. We're in. <laughs> I, I, I see the admins are, are have a whole stream going saying, well, this would work with this and this would work with this and um, a lot of questions because it does have advantages. It is it is a, a game changer, um, and and how nice you you are disruptors, uh, and we yeah. are so yeah. we like that. Um, Good. It, it fits our model. Um, I just want to take a real quick shift. I heard you speak years ago and having to do with the the teenage population and then the over sixty or sixty five population, and and I'm getting very involved with the uh, type one aging population and the issues involved. Mm -hmm. What is it that makes the older type one um, have difficulty? Is it resistance? Is it fatigue? Is it the body is different? Well, I, I don't know. Actually, they do the best in our data set. Um, they really do. So, um, you know, by the time somebody's had type one for 60 years, 50 years, some number of years, there is some autonomic neuropathy that occurs. So um, sensing obviously hypoglycemia becomes a great concern. And then there's some you know, potential frailty and, and certainly it's not exclusive to the type one community. I mean, all of us, um, as we age, I'm, I'm 70, so I'm, I'm, I'm right there with you, John. <laughs> or I may be even there beyond you, I don't know. Um, you know, there's there's just changes that occur with aging, and um, you know, I, I like to um, suggest that none of them are for the better. Um, you know, it's part of the. Well, I, I take it back. I think socially and and um, wisdom. In a lot of there's ways, wisdom. There's wisdom. Yeah, yeah. There's wisdom. Absolutely. There's wisdom. <laughs> there's um, measure. There's you know a, a lot of other things that come along the way, but from a physical standpoint. Um, you know, uh, uh, there's, you know, a lot of people with diabetes without, you know, start to have cardiovascular disease, putting them at, at risk, you know, 
with glycemic variability and hypoglycemia for cardiac events. I mean, there's just, you know, just part of the aging process. But I think from a glycemic management standpoint, um, at least, you know, we spent some time trying to figure out why do they do the best? And they, the answer is, well, they got there because they were doing a good job to begin with. Right. Uh, you know, maybe life's a little bit easier. They're not running around chasing their own kids anymore. Chase your grandchildren only for so long. And then you tell your, call your kids and say, come and get them. Um, and, and, you know, maybe there's a little bit more time and a little bit more commitment to health. Um, you know, I'm going to eat better now that I'm this age and, you know, go for walks and, you know, do what I wanted to do since I thought about working and retiring. Mm -hmm. So, you know, not, it, the whole goal um, for all of us should be to um, age as healthy as possible. And of course, all the precursors start from prenatal time, you know, to put where all the risk factors can be amplified. But no matter what age you are, um, that commitment to staying healthy at any age enables you to be healthy um, in the aging process itself. Absolutely. I have two more questions. Well, okay. one has to do, I'm just curious about your uh, reaction to the, uh, the Yale comments the other day about CGM for type twos is really not very valuable. Um, that it doesn't make any difference. I read that we passed the message around and we're going, what, how, how can you say that? But I guess the outcomes, people don't change. Well, so, well, I, but it's all about the outcome of A1C, right? Um, and then we've got to get beyond A1C. Um, you know, you tell me what, what in type two is even a, a few point difference in ease of uh, burden, uh, you know, is it not worth it? I mean, I think if we stay only with glycemic measurement, it's going to be hard because what do they actually do if they're not taking insulin? Do I hold my pill? Do I take a pill and a half? Do I run around the block? I'm, you know, it, but on the other hand, um, for those who want it and want to use it in part as a behavior change tool, I mean, what we need to really find out is, is CGM a good behavior change tool? So uh, if I was watching my CGM and I put an alarm that I don't wanna see a rate of change that's too fast and I got there, would I, would I stop eating? You know, would I take a walk? I, you know, those are the kind of things where nobody's looked at it and all we're looking at is A1C, which is, you know, like saying, you know, I, I don't know, I have to- come We'll up check with in it. in three months. No, I, in our community, it is an absolute uh, way of making a change. You look at it and go, oh, need to do something, but we're, mm. we're very proactive. So it's, it's important. Um, one more real quick question that came in. How often do readings get updated in your system? Every five minutes. Every five. So it's the same. Any chance that it'll, it'll get down to one or two minutes? Well, it, it could. So, I mean, you know, the only thing is it's all about how long can your power source last? Of course. Makes perfect sense. Um, I asked someone, please, to give us a battery that as we walk through space, we recharge everything we're wearing. Um, I, and I believe that will be coming at some point, but it's not here yet. Um, oh, I know. I love that. We would love to continue dialogue with, with you, your folks and maybe ch chat about where some of the data comes, if that would be all right with you. Um, sure, sure. With you. Um, this has been wonderful. I, I've been watching this since you started doing some work over at Hoke Hospital and mm -hmm. um, really would love to try it. With, really wanted to work with uh, closed loops, but it's coming. I, I, you, it's coming. Yeah, so um, thank you. Thank you so much for oh, your thank time. Thank you. You, you, know, you are um, what energizes us all is, uh, Activated patients, um, activated people. I, you know, it it um, it makes a difference for all of us, right, and for the whole system. You betcha, and we appreciate all your hard work. Um, retire when you want, but I'm sure you won't. So, um, yeah, no, no, keep I, on coming I, back. Yeah, no way. All right. All right.